Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Van Heflin in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite tells of one of the great mysteries of the sea as we recreate the mystery of the Marie Celeste, our star, Mr. Van Heflin. Harlow. Uh, goodbye, Hap. Goodbye? Sure. This is our last show till fall, Hap. Last chance to tell folks about switching to those inspiring, incomparable, and inevitable Autolite spark plugs. The spark plugs that are ignition engineered for the finest performance money can buy. Well, what are you going to do this summer, Harlow? Keep an eye out for exasperated drivers with poorly performing cars, Hap. And then I'll say visit your Autolite spark plug dealer for a brisk brace of Autolite spark plugs, like the amazing Autolite resistor spark plugs, the double life spark plugs that make riding as smooth as a summer breeze. So call Western Union by number and ask for our friend, Operator 25. Yes, sir. Operator 25 will tell you the location of your nearest Autolite spark plug dealer, the man with ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, both standard and resistor type. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents The Mystery of the Marie Celeste, starring Mr. Van Heflin, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. On December 9th, 1872, the American brigantine Marie Celeste was discovered adrift and derelict close off the coast of North Africa. She had sustained some storm damage, but she was still an able ship. Her sails were set, her cargo was intact, conditions in her cabins and forecastle seemed normal. There was no evidence of violence. Yet, not a sign was found of the crew that had manned her. Officers, men, and the captain's wife had vanished, and no acceptable explanation of their disappearance has ever been advanced. But perhaps this is that story. It would start in New York City's Harbor District on the night of November 7th, 1872. The eve of the Marie Celeste departure from that same harbor. see a man running past this way? No, I, I didn't see anybody. I heard the shots. Who is it you're after? He just killed some people. No. Listen. Thought I heard something. But I don't now. Uh, uh, who did this man kill? A young girl. And the man she was with. And then he killed the girl's mother. He's a maniac that we've got to get. I'll look down this way. I'll help if I can. All right. Four men from the force will be here shortly. I didn't remember killing her mother. Grace I killed because I couldn't help it. The man because he came after me when Grace was down, but I never, never meant to kill her mother. When I heard that I had, I wondered if the officer was right. And that I was insane. There wasn't time to think of it then. Only time to think of getting away. And through that night, I searched for a ship that was leaving soon. One that was badly guarded so I could slip aboard. When I found her, she was the Marie Celeste. And a drunken deck watch stayed in his sleep until I was hidden in the number two hole. There I passed two days in a dream... Neither fully awake nor asleep, but always thinking of the horror I'd done. And I knew that escape was wrong. That I could never be sane until I cleared my soul of it. On the third morning, I proceed to make my presence aboard known. 
so that I can go to the captain and tell him of my crime and take the consequences I so richly deserve. I climb to the deck and am immediately seen by a crewman. Hey, Lindley, look! Who's that? You better find out. Who are you, mister, and what are you doing aboard? My name is Sam Newcomb, and, uh, I, uh, I want to talk to your captain. You'll talk to him right enough, whether you want to or not. How'd you get aboard? You'll be lucky if you didn't stand the 12 to 4 watch here last night in port, because that's, that's, uh, when it was. You're uppity for a stowaway, aren't you? You're no better than a thief. Well, I admit that. Look, I, I, I want no trouble with you. Please take me to your captain. I'll talk to him and no one else. You take him, Bull. I'd better stay forward. Yeah. Come on, Newcomb. If you're going to make the rest of the trip with us, you better drop your airs or there'll be trouble. I don't have any airs. And I don't think you'll be trouble with my company. Oh? You mean you don't think you'll quarter with the crew? No. <laughs> you expect to be with the officers, like an honored guest. No. Where, then? Well, I... I don't know. Yeah, you act like you're daft. Don't say that! I'll... I'll... You're what? I'll... Nothing. I'm sorry. I, I I want to talk to your captain. You'll watch what you do and say or you'll be over the side. Here. Yes, come. Watch your language. The skipper's wife is in the next cabin aft. His wife? Well, ah, who's this? He just came out of number two hole, sir. His name is Sam Newcomb. Got aboard on the 12 to 4 watch hour last night in. Hubbard's watch. He'll answer for it. Well, Newcomb, what do you have to say for yourself? I'd, uh, like it if, if I could talk to you alone, sir. Uh, that's all, Bull. Tell Hubbard I'll want to see him as soon as he's off watch. Yes, sir. Now, you realize, Newcomb, that you've committed a crime by boarding this ship without permission. And probably without passport or any other papers, I suppose. I know, sir. But uh, when I tell you why, I, I, I'm not a bad man, sir. N nothing like this has ever happened before. But something drove me. I, 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 I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, another one who's always wanted to go to sea, I suppose. No, uh, uh, no, sir. I've, I've been sailing for ten years. I'm an able hand. I, uh, I came aboard because, uh, well, I, I had to get away. You were in trouble? Yes, sir. I, uh... I, I don't think it was my fault, but I am wrong. What kind of trouble? Well, there was a girl, sir, who I was in love with. And, uh... Well, I, I don't know what came over me, but... Yes? What'd you do to her? I found her with another man, and, uh, I, uh... I, I just had to get away, sir. Uh. A lovesick young calf, eh? Well, that doesn't condone... Uh, ben. Oh, yes, my dear. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I heard you talking. Uh, yes, uh, uh, this is Mr. Newcomb. He came aboard illegally the night before we left. Well, where has he been? It's three days. In number two hole, ma'am. Have you had food and water? No, ma'am. Well, why haven't you come to us before this? I, uh... I don't know, ma'am. He was going to tell me why he came aboard. I don't suppose it's important to anyone but me, but uh, I felt that I had to get away, and... Uh, it was a girl. I almost guessed that. A broken heart? I, I thought it was. I, I know it sounds silly, but to me it seemed awfully serious, and I... I couldn't think of another way to leave as quickly as I wanted to. <clears throat> well, there's no other way I can allow an affair of the heart to influence what I must do in this case. Now, by reputation, I'm a fair and lean well, I'm man. I'm a seaman, sir. I could work my way. I'm not so sure that you deserve the chance. Whatever you say, sir. Ben. Now, oh, please, Grace. Great. Ah, what's the matter with you? Nothing, sir. My name... Grace is the name of the girl. Yes, ma'am. It was learning that the captain's wife was bored that made me change my mind about telling him the truth. When I talked to him, especially after his wife came in, everything was, was turned about. It was though I was the captain and the stowaway was someone else. 
It was as though my wife, my Grace, had come in from the next cabin, and together we talked to this stowaway. And uh, we felt sorry for him, and we wanted to be kind to him. The wife can't be more than three or four years older than I. And I feel close to her right away. I, I think that uh, even if she doesn't know what I've done, she understands me. It's a good feeling to have one friend on the ship. Through her pleas, I'm sure I, I'm not restrained and instead sent to take my place with the crew in their forecastle. There I find no friends. Well, what are you doing here? Couldn't you find a better place to quarter? I was told where to come. Hey, Hubbard. Ah? Uh, Wake up. Here's the one who came aboard during your watch. Oh? Uh? What you figure you'll be fine? A week's pay? Yeah, that's right. Newcomer, huh? Yes. Why'd you come aboard? Why, uh... I wanted to get away from New York. Man's got to have a better reason than that. You running away from the police? No. What then? Well, it wouldn't interest you. It's, it's not important. It's important to me. And I want you to know how I feel about it. Oh. <laughs> Are you going to get up? No. I don't want any trouble with you. You don't want no trouble. You caused me trouble, haven't you? I'll be called up in front of the captain because of you. Well, that's done. There's no, no way I can change it. We've got three weeks before we make Naples. You'll pay for it. I'll see to that. <laughs> Through the following days, I knew no peace. There were four deckhands and a first officer. And although I had reason to fight because of the way they beat me and used me, I didn't. I was afraid of my own violence now that I'd killed. The one named Hubbard, he was the worst. His eyes were always on me. And I, I wondered why. There was a night when I woke to find him bending over my bunk. He was smiling. And from that moment on, even in sleep... I felt him watching me. On another night, I'm on deck. I'm crossing from the port to starboard. And when I pass under the mainyard, a marlin spike falls from aloft and sticks in the planks beside me, narrowly missing my head. I look up to see Hubbard smiling down at me from the rigging. I try to avoid him, but he drops to the deck to face me. I dropped my spike. Yes, I know you did. What are you going to do about it? Nothing. <laughs> you take more than any man I've ever known, Newcomb. Well, I'm not proud of that. Well, why do you keep after me? Why don't you leave me alone? Because I'm a curious man. I want to know truly why you're on this ship. Your story the captain about trouble with some woman just doesn't set right. Well, no, that's the truth. Not all of it. Why do you say that? Anybody ever tell you you talk in your sleep? Autolite is bringing you Mr. Van Heflin in The Mystery of the Marie Celeste. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Well, Harlow, this is it. It sure is, Hap, the Autolite Resistor Spark Plug. The double life spark plug that's the greatest advance in spark plug design for automotive use in the past 25 years. Well, I didn't re mean the resistor spark plug, Harlow. I meant this is our last meeting till fall. Too bad. Too bad, three bad, no matter how many spark plugs are bad. Get them all replaced with a set of sensational Autolite resistor spark plugs. The spark plugs that last twice as long and give smoother engine performance and really quick starts. And the Autolite resistor spark plug is only one of a complete line of Autolite spark plugs, ignition engineered for every use. Is Operator 25 going on vacation too, Harlow? No, sir, Hap. She'll be standing by to tell folks the location of their nearest Autolite spark plug dealer. 
Just call Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Van Heflin in Elliot Lewis's production of The Mystery of the Marie Celeste, a true report well calculated to keep you in suspense. I'd never been told that I talked in my sleep until the one named Hubbard said I did. He may have been lying, but I couldn't chance that. Therefore, I carefully abstained from regular sleeping habits, allowing myself short naps only when I knew that Hubbard was at the helm or some other ship's business that he couldn't leave. The horror of what I had done became a secret that pressed against my head, wanting escape. But I held it in, and I took the abuse of the men aboard. The only kindness and relaxation I find are during the moments when I chance to meet the captain's wife. Off watch one night, when it's not safe to sleep, I'm alone taking a cup of tea in the galley. When she comes in... Oh, Mrs. Briggs. Oh, Mr. Newcomb, I've been thinking of you. I haven't seen you... Well, you look ill. Is something wrong? No, no, nothing, no. My, my, uh, sleep hasn't been so good. And your cheek is bruised. What happened? Oh, it's nothing serious. Uh, just some trouble with the other hands. Have you told the captain? No, no, ma'am. Why not? I shall. No, please, uh, uh, please don't. I've caused enough trouble. I wouldn't want there to be any more. May I have some tea, Mr. Newcomb? Oh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. I think you're a very kind man, Mr. Newcomb. You do? Yes. To protect the other hands, for one thing. They're a rough lot, I know. No worse than most men, ma'am. You're very unhappy, aren't you? This girl, Grace, I know this is hard for you to understand, but really, no one girl is worth ruining your life for. Not even losing sleep over. Yes, ma'am. I, I wish you'd stop calling me ma'am. Perhaps if you did, you could talk to me about this girl. I think it'd do you good, don't you? Well, I don't know. Tell me about her. I'm sure she's quite beautiful. Well, I thought so. And you plan to be married? Yes. But she changed her mind? She was never sure... Uh, she was ambitious for me. That's natural. And I, I disappointed her like I did my family, my, my mother, everybody. I, I'm always thinking that I'm doing my best, but I always disappoint people. What did she want you to be, this girl? A ship's master, like your husband. We dreamed of the day when she could sail with me, like, like you do on this ship. Well, you mustn't lose faith in yourself. It took my husband years to get his papers. There are no years for me anymore. She wouldn't wait? No. No, she, she wouldn't wait. You must have waited, but, but she wouldn't. Tell me. It'll be good for She you. promised to wait, but she didn't. She never understood that it took time. She was ambitious, and she pushed me for my officer's papers, and, and I failed. My family pushed me, too, but when I wasn't ready, they made me fail. And I went away, a six-month trip to South America. I, I, I tried to jump overboard, and they stopped me, and... Oh. Then I got back and found her married to a ship's captain. Her mother was there, laughing at me. Well, I, I tried to tell him that I was happy about it. Then Grace smiled at me and something happened. Mr. Newcomb. I was only going to kill her. I, I didn't even know that the others were there. And I hit her and, and she went down and then this man came after me and I hit him too. Well, when you get mixed up like that, you don't know wh what you're doing. And time means nothing, like like everything else. Mr. Newcomb... Then I... her mother... Well, and I, I don't remember that. But she's dead, too, and they blame me. Maybe I did. Mrs. Big, where, where are you going? Stay away from me. No, 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 you've been nice to me. Why did it have to be you that I told everything? Oh! No, no, I like you. Why did it have to be you? Oh! No! 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 No, 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 I don't want to kill you. I, I never wanted to kill anybody. Let me go. No, no, I won't hurt you. You, you. You've been nice to me. Stay away from me. 
No, 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 I, I won't touch you. But, but you, you've got to promise that you won't tell. I don't, I don't know why I said those things. They, they're not true. See, I get mixed up. I dream things, and then they seem real after I wake up. That's why I, I'm such a liar. I always lie. That's, there's nothing that I told you was the truth. Do, do you believe that? Yes. And, and you, you, you won't uh, tell anybody what I said. I... Huh? Won't tell anyone. No, well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I'm... No, no, uh, c- come, Mrs. Briggs, and finish your tea. Come on, we'll talk, we'll talk about something else. No, I've got to go to my cabin. Mrs. Briggs, don't, don't tell. I knew she would tell. So I hid. I, I went back to the number two hole where I'd felt safe before. They found me there. I don't know how much time passed. I see their lantern as they come closer. The truth is out. There's no place for me to go. So I I stand up and wait. <laughs> Captain, I hear him, I think. Yes, help him. Keep your pistol ready. You have to be careful. Yes, sir. There he is, sir. Come out of there, Newcomb. Keep your lantern down, Hubbard. Keep us under the light. He's dangerous. No, I won't. I won't cause any trouble, sir. Get him out of there. I won't cause any trouble. It's all right, sir. He's down. A dirty little scum. Lock him up. I'm not sure how many days passed, but I found comfort in being locked up because I could sleep without the fear of Hubbard leaning over me, listening for what I might say. Then there was one night when shouting on deck woke me up. I couldn't hear the words being in the middle of the ship, but soon the shouting stopped and there was silence. It was a new silence that I studied for a long time. I heard no footsteps on the deck. I heard no voices. I heard no creaking timbers. It was a dead ship. I wait for the one daily meal that they allow me. And no one comes. And then I shout, Let me out! Let me out of here! Somebody come and let me out! If one were insane, he'd surely break at a moment like that. I was locked up and alone on a ship that was held motionless as if gripped by some great hand. But I didn't break. I dismantled my bunk and from the wood fashioned a ram with which I attacked the door. The task of freeing myself consumed most of the day. And such was my concentration that I didn't realize the exact moment that the ship began moving. As if a great hand had released its grip and set her free. And I was free. I come out on deck to find a cloudless sky and empty sea horizons all around. As if I'm alone in the world. The wheel spinning idly with no one to attend it. I lash it after fitting a new course to the sails she's wearing. The whole ship is mine. I am master and crew. I found peace and well-being. As if I've been absolved of any wrongs I ever did. Because what, if not Providence, held the ship that night and sent the others to certain death in the endless sea? What, if not kind Providence, decided that I alone would survive? The meek and the humble shall inherit the earth. This narrative I swear to be true. And on this second day of December, the year of our Lord, 1872, I hereby sign it and seal it in a bottle to be delivered to the ocean's currents in the hope that someday it'll drift back to the hated world from which I am forever parted. According to scientific theory, 
A strange phenomenon takes place now and again off the coast of Africa near where the Marie Celeste was found. Great rivers of sand are swept out from the coastal deserts. When certain conditions prevail, this sand is concentrated by the ocean's currents. Millions of tons are massed until an island is born, lives briefly, and then is swept away by a shift in the currents that created it. One such island formed under a small ship during World War II, held it for a number of hours, then released it, much in the same manner that Sam Newcomb's Providence acted. A like occurrence could have caused the abandonment of the Marie Celeste, but no one knows. According to some reports, Sam Newcomb's signed confession did drift ashore many years later. If that is true, perhaps another of the many mysteries surrounding the Marie Celeste has been solved. That mystery was a short length of line that reportedly was found secured to the stern of the ship, close up under the transom where someone would hide. Attached to this line was a man's leather belt that had parted in the middle. Could Sam Newcomb have hidden there when the salvage crew was put aboard to sail the ship to Gibraltar? Could he have hung suspended there against the weakening belt until it parted? and let him sink silently into the sea. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Van Heflin. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite, world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. They are members of the Autolite family, as well as are the 98,000 Autolite distributors and dealers in the United States and thousands more in Canada and throughout the world. Our family also includes the nearly 30,000 men and women in 28 great Autolite plants from coast to coast and Autolite plants in many foreign countries, as well as the 18,000 people who have invested a portion of their savings in Autolite. Every Autolite product is backed by constant research and precision built to the highest standards of quality and performance. So remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. <laughs> Now I'd like to bring to the microphone a member of the Autolite family, the producer-director of Suspense, Mr. Elliot Lewis. Tonight's Suspense program is the last for this season. Suspense on television will continue through the summer. Starting next week at this same time, CBS Radio will present a new series of true crime mysteries, crime classics by name, which I heartily recommend to be worth your listening until Suspense returns in September. And so until that time, all of us of the Autolite family thank you for your support and attention during this last season. We'll see you in September on... Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Bluskin. The Mystery of the Marie Celeste was adapted for Suspense by Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Joseph Kearns, Jeanette Nolan, Paul Fries, Dan O'Hurlihy... Hal Gerard and William Conrad. Van Heflin may currently be seen in Shane, a George Stevens production for Paramount. You can buy Autolite resistor or standard type spark plugs, Autolite electrical parts, and Autolite stay full batteries at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Have a good summer. And good night. This is the CBS Radio Network.